Okay, so let's begin our second lecture. Um, and I like to start the next lecture with a review of the previous. Uh, for those of you who are absent during class or if um, you miss something, it's great to always have a review. All right, so let's start. Uh, these are questions, for example, when you're preparing for a test, you may want to know. Um, the question is, why is it important for anyone in our society to have knowledge of research methods? Ultimately, there are four reasons. One is critical consumption of, of research. Uh, you read a magazine, you read a newspaper, they will make a claim, and we have to be able to examine whether these are true. Uh, two is many professions rely on it. Uh, psychology and the therapeutic interventions we do are heavily based on what's considered acceptable um, based on science. Three, legislation and policy making. If I was a politician and I wanted to know whether or not a bike path would be great to put in a certain place, I might do research uh, just to survey my constituents and see what they thought. And then um, in terms of what you call it, measuring the effectiveness of programs, it's good for that uh, reason. So the four purposes or uh, reasons why it's important for anyone in our society to have knowledge are as stated. What are the pre-scientific methods? Again, we talked about scientific methods and what's different uh, from pre-scientific methods. But uh, when we talk about pre-scientific methods, the first is intuition, and that's when we follow our gut blindly. Um, the second is authority, when we follow uh, a leader blindly. Uh, the third one is tenacity. And that's where we started the previous recording. Uh, and that's sticking to your gut blindly. Uh, then we have the a priori method, right, which is uh, where we take in what society says without questioning. And then we have scientific method, right? And scientific method is very important. So when we talk about the scientific method, uh, we talk about being empirical. That is to say, we want to see concrete, observable information. Um, and we also talk about skepticism, which is the ability to question one's findings. Uh, the next question is, what is pseudoscience? Pseudoscience is something that appears to look like science. It sounds like science, but it's not science. So they may use uh, jargon or buzzwords that we would use, or they may attach themselves to an organization that's reputable, but uh, they themselves are not credible. Uh, define and give examples of the four goals of uh, scientific research. So the four goals of scientific research, as we said, were to describe um, what we see and the observational strategies allow for us to do that, uh, to predict and correlational strategies allow us to do that, to determine cause and effect, experiments allow us to do that, and then to explain the underlying meaning of it all, experiments also allow us to do that. And now I would like to distinguish between basic and applied research. Uh, basic research is more theoretical and it serves as the foundation knowledge uh, that is then used for more applied research. And applied research is the more um, tangible, practical side of research. Usually it's designed to solve problems within society. Um, we did ask a question which one was better and we demonstrated that both are equally necessary because it's usually the basic research that drives applied and then applied we find gaps and therefore we need to do more basic and it creates a cycle over and over and over. Important definitions. Uh, so alternative explanations. This was one of Cook and Campbell's uh, components of a true experiment. And ultimately, it's not it, alternative explanations. We want to eliminate alternative explanations. Uh, that is to say, we want to eliminate any other reason why we could have had the effect. 
only the cause should result in the effect. I defined applied research. Authority is a leader within society, a parent, a clergy member, a professor, etc. Uh, we define basic research. Covariation of the cause, that means in the presence of the cause, we get the effect. In the absence of the cause, we don't get the effect. Empiricism is directly observable data. And the goals of science, uh, we covered the four goals in the questions. Intuition is our gut feeling. Peer review is a panel of, of experts who evaluate our work. Uh, and their whole goal is to determine whether or not um, we found something meaningful. Um, there are usually about three people on a peer review. The reviewers will give you feedback. And they may accept your work. They may reject your work. Um, and the vast majority of work usually gets rejected the first go around. Program evaluation, this is uh, a form of applied research where we look to see if something like DARE or, or sex ed or things like that are effective. And um, if they are effective, then we evaluate whether they're efficient. That is to say, are they worth the amount of money we're putting into them? And that's program evaluation. Pseudoscience we define, skepticism we define, and temporal precedence. This is also uh, in the Cook and Campbell, uh, three factors to associate with cause. Uh, and that is to say that cause must always precede the effect. Okay, so I think we're ready to start. So what are the learning objectives for this uh, lecture? The first learning objective is to discuss how a hypothesis is different from a prediction, talk about sources of ideas for research, uh, identify functions of a theory. We also want to talk about searches. Uh, so you're going to have your first homework assignment. I'm going to give it to you in class uh, next week. Uh, but it starts with a search engine, and I need to teach you about um, where to find psychology-based research articles. I need to show you the components or elements of an article. Some of this is really basic, and you may have learned it in your undergrad class, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, so let's do it. What is a hypothesis? A hypothesis is a tentative idea or question that is waiting for evidence to either support it or refute it. That is to say, we believe X and Y go together in a certain kind of way. Now, hypotheses can be stated in, in uh, the form of a question or a sentence. An informal hypothesis uh, is usually more of a question, right? It's an informal question, which says something like this. Do males and females differ in drinking habits? And we know the answer. The answer is yes. We know males typically drink more than females in general. We know that their tolerance is higher. We know the, the rates of alcohol use disorders are higher. We know this, but the point is, is that this kind of hypothesis is sort of like a general question about the relationship between gender and drinking habits. And then data is collected to answer the question. A formal hypothesis it's said more definitively, uh, um, we're going to say A and B are directly related. So, for example, we might say high doses of caffeine interfere with test taking. Now, um, what you need to know about hypotheses, because we're going to talk about the difference between hypotheses and predictions, is the way your book teaches hypotheses. Hypotheses are, in general, and predictions are more specific uh, to what's going to happen in your research study. All right. So hypothesis is a more general relationship between variables. Your prediction is what's going to happen. So uh, in this case of uh, high doses of caffeine interfere with test taking, uh, we can make this statement about the general relationship because there is solid evidence. We would be more asking a question if we didn't know what was going on. So informal hypotheses are done when less information is, is known about a topic. And formal hypotheses are done when more is known about a topic. 
Okay. So prediction, again, I want to make the distinction because it will come up on a test. Uh, a prediction is a statement or assertion about what's going to happen in a given or particular research investigation, your study. So instead of saying males and females differ in drinking or will differ, you might say, in my study, I, I predict that males will score higher in drinking. Now, uh, if you do the study and the results uh, come back consistent with your uh, prediction, um, you would say the hypothesis is supported. Now, this is a distinction, and I'm pretty OCD about it, is nothing in science is ever proven. Remember last lecture we mentioned about things have to be falsifiable, things have to come into question, and it, as soon as the data no longer supports an assertion, we challenge it. So if we find research that supports our, our hypothesis, we say the hypothesis is supported. All right, now what happens if the, the research comes in and it is inconsistent with what we thought would happen? We could do one of two things. There, you could reject your hypothesis. You could say, I was wrong. Or you could continue to study this using different methods. Now, why would we want to do that? Our outcomes can be influenced by the way we choose to collect data. And that's an important point. So you may want to say, well, in my design, what kind of limitations did I create? And I'll create uh, a different study using different methods, and maybe they won't have those limitations. Uh, as we progress in a semester, I think this will make more sense. Okay. Uh, now, the more a hypothesis is supported over and over and over, and the, the more it's supported under varied conditions, we say we have greater confidence in the result, right? So I'm, I'm giving you a linguistic way to speak. The, our hypothesis was supported, our hypothesis was unsupported, or, or, or failed to support our hypothesis, these kind of language. Uh, and then if you have multiple studies doing the same thing, you might say that uh, we have greater confidence in our finding because we had three studies that support our hypotheses. Okay. The next circle that we talk about, or wheel, is inductive versus deductive reasoning. So there are two ways to think about general theory and data. And in inductive reasoning, uh, we start with the data and we formulate th uh, the theory later. Um, now, you could challenge this approach. You could say that inductive reasoning is problematic because you're uh, crafting your theory based on the data. Okay, it's a, it's a limitation, I agree. Um, the uh, alternative to inductive reasoning is deductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning, we start with a well-established theory, and then we collect the data based on or grounded in that theory. Uh, so I ask you which one is better, uh, and it's a setup, right? We need both, and it goes round and round. Uh, in some cases, Inductive reasoning is most appropriate. In some cases, deductive reasoning is most appropriate. And then it doesn't matter where we start in this circle or wheel, it's gonna go round and round. Um, and let me just draw attention to something. Um, in uh, cases where you're studying a novel idea, no one has ever studied studied this, it's impossible to use deductive reasoning because there may be no theories about this. So imagine you discovered a new island and there were people who lived on this island and you wanted to try and better understand their cultural practices or their ritualistic practices. Could you go and establish a theory before observing them? The answer is no, because there's no past research to rely on. Um, so in well-researched studies, deductive reasoning is oftentimes used more readily, 
in newer uh, areas where there's no general theories, we oftentimes start with inductive reasoning. And we need both. Okay, so linguistics, I want to teach you a little bit about uh, linguistics in APA format. Uh, the terminology changes uh, between humans and animals. In general, we refer to human beings as participants. In general, we refer to animals as subjects. Uh, you can use subjects uh, if you're described as human beings, but it's better to use participants. Um, if you're doing survey research, uh, you would describe the individuals as respondents because they're actually responding to your survey. And if you're doing some kind of like gr um, a group study or studying the culture of an organization, the people who participate might be referred to as informants. Uh, and this research strategy is used more in anthropology and sociology, but you might see these terminologies. Okay, so where do we get ideas? Where, do, where does research come from? One is common sense. Two is the observations around us. Uh, three are general theories that are out there. Four is past research. And five is practical problems. Now let's look at these. Uh, you may have heard that common sense is not so common. And I'm going to say something similar to what I said about intuition as a pre, uh, like a non-scientific or pre-scientific thinking. Common sense is a great source of an idea as long as you don't assume that it's correct without testing it. So I would like to say common sense is, the good, is a good starting point for research. Um, so let's take a, a saying, a proverb, you spare the rod, you spoil the child, right? This is something that has been said for thousands of years, and it has suggested that corporal punishment is a good thing and is as necessary in the development of a child. What do we know about it? What does modern research say about corporal punishment and child development? Um, well, the answer is it's strongly uh, opposed. Cur the current state of research suggests that corporal punishment has a, a negative psychological impact on a child. Uh, it increases the risk of anxiety di disorders, mood disorders, substance use disorders, truancy, um, poor grades in the classroom, uh, increases their risk of uh, using corporal punishment with their own kids. Uh, it also um, is found that many parents use this with not with the intent of like parenting, but they use it as a, a way of getting rid of their own frustration. And when you do that, that could you could cause significant physical harm to your kids. So currently, uh, uh, research is strongly opposed to this. It's a it's not a good thing. But you know there are many people across the globe who believe that corporal punishment is a good thing. And in full disclosure, I am a child or a product of corporal punishment. Um, so it, there could be generational differences, but I'm going to tell you it's not good. Okay, so that's common sense. Things that we all believe to be true, they may or may not be true. So what makes it valuable is that you can then take that uh, assumption of being true and then test it with research. Okay. Um, and then the, the other side, you spoil the child. So the assumption is that um, if you don't hit them, then they're going to be spoiled. Uh, again, modern psychologists have found other ways, right? There are other ways to discipline that don't require corporal punishment things like timeout, things like positive reinforcement, and so forth, all could be used instead of corporal punishment. Observations um, of the real world around us. If you are careful about what's happening around you, 
it's a remarkable, it's a wellspring of information. Uh, because science starts with good observations or careful observations. Um, so pay attention to what's happening in your personal life, pay attention to social events, and they could be sources uh, of research studies. Um, I know I went on a mini sermon last week with you and I told you, get a notebook. Write down your ideas because if you're very, very careful, you will not lack uh, the ability to do research. Questions about the nature of humanity, questions about um, politics and religion and all these things keep me busy. Uh, and, you know, I'm never, never struggling. So careful observation, pay attention to what's happening in the world, write down your ideas. Maybe you could create a study out of it. Uh, things happen, right? If you're carefully observing, things happen and they're unexpected. Now, there's a term called serendipity when something fortuitous happens by chance. And I put chance in quotes because it's not really chance. It's whatever. It's things fall into place and it looks like it's just by accident, uh, good timing or whatever. Um, if you're opportunistic in a good way and you pay attention to what's happening, you can jump on this. Uh, an example is Pavlov. Everybody knows uh, Pavlov and everyone knows his research on classical conditioning. I got news for you. Pavlov was not a psychologist. He was a medical doctor and he was studying the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, which goes from the brain to the gut. And he was studying digestion. In fact, he won a Nobel Prize for his work on that vagus nerve, not classical conditioning. But he noticed something peculiar. He thought that when you put food on the tongue, there was a reflexive action that um, an organism, in this case dogs, would salivate. Right? So it was a reflex to food hitting the tongue. But he noticed that his dog started to salivate even when uh, there was no food on the tongue. And he was baffled by this. What's going on? And he discovered that these dogs learn to anticipate food. So when they would hear the footsteps of his graduate students, they would salivate even before the study started. And uh, the question was like how that happened. So he created a study where he would eliminate all the sound all of the uh, anticipatory effects other than whatever stimulus he wanted. And he systematically demonstrated that if you pair two stimuli together, you can learn to anticipate and you can get something called a condition response. Uh, but his original work had nothing to do with learning theory. His original work had nothing to do with classical conditioning. Yet, he, because he was very observant and he saw the things happening around him, uh, he was able to capitalize on that. I'll give you, again, you know, um, I like to talk about current events, so it's possible that if you ever get sick of it, just let me know. But Donald Trump, um, I did a study at the College of Staten Island, uh, which is under review, Hopefully it gets published, and when it gets published, I'll share it with you. Uh, myself, Florette Cohen, and a third researcher, uh, we did a study on something called mortality salience. Because mortality salience is the idea that the thought or the prospect of one's own death makes us stick to preconceived values more, or more conservative values. So what we did was we had people read passages. One group of people, they read passages that were neutral. Another group of passages, uh, they read uh, and it activated thoughts of their own death. And then 
we basically asked them for their support for Donald Trump as president. Um, and what we found was that invariably, when we primed people or we got them thinking about their own death, the support for Donald Trump went up. Isn't that interesting? Now, if Donald Trump was not running for office, we wouldn't be doing that study, or we might be doing that study with another Republican candidate and comparing it to a Democrat, because Democrats do not get a bump in either either condition. So it's 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 pretty fascinating. Hopefully this study gets published soon, and then maybe I can share it with you before the end of the semester. But pay attention to to the world around you. It's a, a wellspring of ideas. Okay. Theories. So the next thing we, we have is that uh, we have tremendous theories. There are a lot of theories that are on the books. And what are, what are we really doing with theories? What's their benefit? So I say that theories typically do two things. The first is that they organize and explain uh, large amounts of information. So one of the better theories that we have to date is Darwin's theory of evolution. And Darwin's theory of evolution organizes and explains various um, natural phenomena. And it basically states, and I'm going to give you the theory of evolution in one sentence so you don't have to read the whole book. Um, survival of the fittest via natural selection. In that one sentence, it says everything you need to know about evolution. Remarkable. So it organizes and explains. So I like to say this as it says a lot with few words. A second major thing that theories can do is it generates new knowledge. And this too is uh, another reason why I think Darwin's theory of evolution is awesome. Because if you believe in evolution, then you're going to do research to try and support the theory of evolution. If you disagree with the theory of evolution, then you're going to do research to try and refute it or to disprove it. Now, the theory of evolution gains more and more studies from both sides. So it generates a lot of new knowledge, whether we support it, whether we don't. So that's a, a nice uh, thing about uh, theories. Uh, it also, aside from what's on the slide, it should be falsifiable. I think we talked about that. Good theories run the risk of being disproven. Um, and there have been old theories that we just don't talk about anymore. And it'll continue to happen. So you might be saying, what's the difference between a theory and an idea? An idea is when something pops into your head. Huh, wouldn't it be interesting if dot, dot, dot. What do we do after this pops into our head? Nothing. We continue to go about our business, right? Theories are different than ideas because it's not something that pops into our head. We actually start to collect data. We start to make observations. We start to do research. We start to develop hypotheses. And it's only once uh, the theory is supported or, or an idea is supported, then we could say it's a theory. Is that clear? So ideas are these things that come in our head, whether they're uh, founded or unfounded doesn't matter. Theories are always grounded in data. Okay, so so far I've given you uh, the top half of where ideas come from. And ultimately we need to move ideas to a point of a research study. And if you could look at my cursor, right? So we've talked about common sense. We've talked about observations, theories. Um, we haven't talked about past research yet or practical problems, but we will. And then library search, we will. This establishes an idea. This is what tells us what we should be studying. Then we actually do this study. And then once we have that information, we formulate new hypotheses. And you'll notice this 
is a circle. So again, a common theme for us as researchers is that we constantly have to regenerate knowledge, constantly have to do more and more studies, and it's a circle. So past research. So past research is a great source of information, and sometimes people are like, well, in order to get published, there has to be something novel about um, what we're doing. And the question becomes, if we're just looking at past research, how are we producing something novel? Well, the reality is if you read a research article, what you will find is that they start all the same way, right? They start with explaining what they're going to do, and they tell you what was missing, and they try and answer a question. And they all end at the same way. And they say, you know what? We only could answer this question. It would be nice to answer a new question. So if you read other journals, at the end, they have a section called future research. And if you take one of their ideas and you do what they suggest, that's why past research can be helpful. Another way is if you look in the method section of a study, they tell you uh, who the population was, uh, what the setting was, their methodology, all of these things. If you change anything about the methodology, that subtle difference makes your study novel. So past research is another way that we can continue to generate and develop a line of research. All right. Now, another important thing is that aside from collecting the data, we can notice inconsistencies. The more familiar you are with past research, you could start to develop a more of like a bird's eye view and say, these group of people see it this way, these group of people see it this way. Why are they arguing? What's the difference between these two camps? and you might formulate your own idea of how to address these differences. So past research is good that way. Another thing, uh, another source of research ideas are practical problems. So uh, I use this in terms of program evaluation, whatnot, and policy making. If city, if city council wanted to do a bike path, uh, you know, that's a practical problem. They need to know where to do it, how to do it, and if you're given $10 million, let's say, to make this happen, you might start to invest uh, your money in the wrong places without research. So you might want to spend some time surveying bikers, right, and asking them what terrain is best for a bike path. Okay. So that's that. Those are the sources of ideas. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about are journals. Uh, once we do our research, right, after an experiment is done or conducted, we have to submit our work to journals for publishing. Um, now, the editor will then, once we submit it, the editor will assign this journal article to three people and they are going to evaluate the quality. Remember what I said about peer review? That's the second bullet point, is when the editor uh, selects experts to read it or evaluate it, um, they're serving as the peer review process. Now, you, you have different options. Uh, after this review, you may get an outright rejection. I'm sorry, this is not suitable for our journal. You may get something called a revise and resubmit, I'm sorry, we can't accept your study as follows. We think that you need to do a second study in the following way for it to be strong enough for our journal. So revise and resubmit. Um, you can get a conditional acceptance, which means that you're accepted, but you have to make revisions, or you can get an outright acceptance. Um, most articles are either rejected or revised and resubmit. Now, even if it gets accepted, it still will take time. Between acceptance to publication is about a year. So studies that come out are oftentimes two, three years after data collection. It takes a long time. Uh, so aside from errors and 
research methods, uh, errors in uh, APA format, why would things get rejected? Sometimes there aren't enough pages in the journal to accept that article. So they get rejected for that grounds too. Uh, it's important to understand that each journal has a focus and that's the reason why people get rejected is that they submit an article to a journal that it doesn't belong to. So know the, the primary focus of the journal and know why um, your research is relevant. You have to write a cover letter even explaining why you think it's a good fit for their journal, right? Um, but there are thousands upon thousands of journals and each journal publishes, you know, let's say 10 articles in one issue. You can't read every single journal, right? It's just too much information. So there has to be ways to reduce this information uh, in a meaningful way. So imagine doing a dissertation or writing a paper in the 1800s. You would have actually had to read every journal article. The good news is you don't have to do that now. So let's talk about it. The first major step towards reducing uh, articles was abstracts. There's something called psychological abstracts. This started in the 1920s. Um, and the goal was that instead of having people read the whole article, what if you could write a brief summary, 120 words, 250 words, just to capture the essence of the study. Now, you read that, great, you'll know whether or not uh, it's meaningful. Now, you'll see if, if it was started in 1927, that's before the internet. That's before com like the, the use of computers the way we have it. So even the abstracts were published. So they were published in hard copy once a month. So you had to wait until they came out, go to the library, and read each abstract because it wasn't organized like one by one in, an, in a systematic way. It was organized by month of publication. So you would have to read cover to cover these abstracts to determine whether you want to read the article. So more efficient, but not as efficient as we would like. But now we have computers and we have search engines. So uh, with the search engines, you could go to EBSCOhost, which is the one that Keen uses and most colleges use, uh, and click Academic Search Complete, and, and you will get some of these articles or, or databases, pardon me. One database that's useful is something called PsychInfo. Now, PsychInfo is run by the American Psychological Association, and they publish uh, articles from the beginning of the, the psychology. Again, psychology started in 1879, so they publish from the 1800s all the way to the present. Now, using PsychInfo is good because there are classic research studies that you might want to have access to. However, um, you also want to be in touch with the most current research, the most up-to-date research. So there's something called Psych First. Now Psych First uh, is uh, the last three years. And that will, between Psych Info, which gives you the classics in research, and Psych First, which gives you the more contemporary research, you put it together, you can write a solid paper, you could do a good dissertation, thesis, or whatever it may be. So when you're doing a search, in Psych Info, you type in a phrase, right? Uh, and I may actually show you this uh, when I come in. Actually, not may. I'm definitely going to show you this uh, when I come in next week. Uh, you type in a name, a phrase, whatever, and then you could search to see how many articles have that title or phrase. I, now, it gives you the option to click whether this phrase has to be in the title. Uh, if there's an author you know, a famous author, you may look up their work. So for example, if you were studying dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, you might write Marsha Linehan as an author and you would want all of her work. Um, 
if there's a journal that you know publishes great work on a topic, uh, you might type in the journal article or abstract. So you can actually select what uh, words you're searching for and where they have to be, and that's very helpful. Now, when you search, you're, if you don't search properly, you're going to get thousands upon thousands of studies. Uh, so there are these things called Boolean operators, basically computer algorithms that tell you either to expand, limit, restrict your search. So let's let me introduce you to a couple. The first one is uh, the Boolean operator A N D N. When you tell the search engine um, uh, visual hallucinations and schizophrenia, the A N D means that it limits your search to only articles that have both the words schizophrenia and um, visual hallucinations. If it has one or the other, you won't get that article. You could use or. This is when there are synonyms. This is when a theory is um, mixed, right? You may know multiple synonyms. So you might say um, cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy because some people uh, expanded cognitive therapy to CBT. And then it'll give you articles of just C, uh, cognitive therapy and then articles just of cognitive behavioral therapy. So OR expands your search. So end limits or restricts your search or expands it. NOT. Okay, NOT is exclusionary. NOT tells the search, the computer, any article with this word do not give me. So let's say I wanted to look up visual hallucinations and I was really interested in migraines, right? But I know visual hallucinations are, I'm going to get a lot of schizophrenia work, whatever. I might say um, visual hallucinations, not schizophrenia, not LSD or whatever. And that tells the computer, I want to get the studies that have the concept of visual hallucinations in there, but it should not be based on LSD. It should not be based on schizophrenia. Is that clear? So it, it's it excludes or eliminates uh, factors. And then the last one, which is really cool, and this I use pretty regularly, is the asterisk. This is more than what goes on the back of Barry Bond's baseball card. Uh, an asterisk tells the computer to finish the word with anything that it could. So I give you the example of child. Uh, there are many words that you could search that are related to the word child. Child itself, or you could add a suffix of children, R-E-N, or childhood, right? And, and so forth. But what the computer will do is it'll look for all the words that start with uh, child and then it'll look for everything else. Okay, so again, some strategies, a recap. Use uh, the field such as the title or author. That's helpful. Use end to limit a search or to expand a search, not to exclude a search. The wildcard asterisk to include many words that have different suffixes. So we talked about um, database search. Uh, what about citation indices? There are tons of these. So we talk about Scopus is a very common one. Um, and then your book talks about the science citation index or social science citation index. What does this do? Instead of keeping track of the article, uh, which it does, it keeps track of who cited the article. So a citation index will give you a list on how many times a given article was cited. So the science citation index are the natural or biological sciences, things like biology, chemistry, biomedicine, pharmacology. The social sciences are the more of the behavioral sciences like sociology, psychology, 
economics, criminal justice, things like that. So uh, you could search a citation index. Now in this citation index, you could search by a key article or a key person. And then anytime this person or this article was cited, you could get all their work. So this is pretty useful. All right, so library search, electronic databases. I talked to you about uh, PsycInfo, PsychFirst. There are other electronic search engines, things like First Search, Sociological Abstracts, Medline, Eric, Psych Articles, etc. All of these are great. What about the internet? Can we rely on the internet? The answer is it depends. All governmental um, websites are credible. You can rely on that. I don't believe in conspiracy theories. Uh, websites that are tied to an education institution like Keen, things written on Keen's website, you can rely on. Uh, and then beyond that, it becomes questionable. What about the dot coms and the dot um, orgs? It's much more questionable. So edu and gov, you can rely on. Org. It depends. Some are have a strong agenda, others are more objective. Uh, and then .com, most .coms you cannot rely on. However, Google, Google is a .com, they have something called Google Scholar, which is www.scholar.google.com, and you could search in Google Scholar. That's credible. Uh, you could search professional meetings. Uh, professional meetings, they screen who presents. So that's credible. Uh, and general websites, check for a site sponsor. See who's um, endorsing this website. Are they credible? Are they not? See who the webmaster is. Look up the webmaster, see if they have any biases. See their timelines. If the website was last updated in 1992, you probably should be suspicious of that website. And then look at the links that they put on their website. These are all helpful. Now, let's move to the anatomy of a research article. Uh, when we look at the anatomy of a research article, we have the title and author's abstract intro methods, results, discussion, and references. I'm going to go through all of them. So what is the title? The title is 12 words or less. Uh, it's a, sum, uh, a very brief, catchy, but informative uh, label of what you did. Uh, ideally, you should have the independent variable and the dependent variable in your title so that when a person reads your title, they know what you studied. So I, I love how uh, people do these like really catchy titles, but that doesn't show anything. Uh, it's problematic. Typically 12 words. The authors, uh, they're there, and usually you list the authors and their affiliation, what university they're um, from whatnot. Um, here's the title page. I'm going to skip all the APA stuff too. Disregard the APA. Um, all right. Now the intro. The intro is the next major part of uh, the research study. Uh, this outlines the problem. This introduces all the relevant theories or past research. And this is where you state your formal or informal hypotheses and predictions. Um, so if you want to examine an introduction section, ask yourself, did you understand what the author's goal was? Did you understand what hypothesis will be tested? Did you understand the author's predictions? And then to get you to think of the methodology or the method section, I ask you, if you had to design this experiment, how would you do it? So think about it that way. So I'm skipping all of the APA stuff. Um, now, let's go to the method section. What does the method section have? It has an overview of the design. So how you conducted the research, uh, whether it's correlational, experimental, uh, the, um, the recruitment methods, etc. cetera. Um, that's all in the design. Then you have your participant section. Is it a human model or animal model, male, female, ages, average age, number of participants, and so forth? Then your procedures. I like to talk about the procedures as uh, 
step by step how you did your study. It's almost like a recipe. You need to follow steps. So make sure it's written clear enough that you, someone could replicate your study. And then the equipment or testing materials, you might see this written as instruments, a description of those. So the first thing, now that you've read the method section, I want you to start to ask yourself the following questions. Remember how you uh, answered how you would design your study? Is your way better than the author's? And if it is, then you might ask yourself, well, why did the author do it the way they did? Um, the next question is, did the authors actually uh, test the hypothesis that they said? Do you know what the independent variable, dependent variable, and control variables are? Again, independent variable is the variable you manipulate. Dependent variable is the variable you measure. Control variables are everything held constant to eliminate confounds. Um, and then, what would you expect to find? I ask you this question now because it's before you read the method section. I want you to think about what the result should be. And then we go to a results section, right? The results section tells you what did they find. Now, in the results section, you report findings in different ways. One is in a narrative form. There's something called qualitative research. You write it in a narrative, in words. Two, and even actually quantitative research you write in paragraph form. Two, you have statistical language, means, standard deviation, uh, t-test, ANOVA, whatever it is. And then you have uh, visual or pictorial representations, and that's in tables and figures. Tables have numbers, figures have pictures. Okay, so then to critically examine that, you ask yourself, uh, did the author get unexpected results? How would I interpret the results? What applications? I'm getting you to think about the discussion. In the discussion, you review research from the various perspectives. You present strengths and weaknesses of your approach. You compare your findings with the past uh, research, and then you start talking about practical applications and future research. See that last bullet? Remember I said if you read other studies, uh, it could be a source of ideas? Because in the discussion section, they say suggestions for future research include, and then you could do that. Now, I do want to make a distinction between um, the results section and the discussion section. The results section say only what you found. That's it. The discussion section is where you start to interpret it and compare your findings to past research. Past research. All right. Um, skipping um, the um, APA style. Now, the last section are your references. Your references go at the end. And references are references. Do not do recommended readings. You, the authors that you cite in the body of the paper should be the same as the ones you cite uh, in your reference section, right? Uh, and people always make this mistake. They mislabel it. They call it a bibliography. They call it a work cited page. All of that's incorrect. Just make sure your references are the same as in the body of the text.